Hello class and welcome back to Geology 12. I'm going to continue my lecture series on patterns in the sky and today I want to look at reasons for the seasons and a lot of this is coming from the reading assignment I posted on campus for you guys to do. And really the, the main reason we have seasons on Earth is because of the tilt of Earth's axis, right? It's, it's 23 and a half degrees with respect to the perpendicular to the ecliptic, right? And it's always pointed in the same direction. Uh, although there is a precession over time that it will start pointing in a different direction, but it's always constant and the angle will, has not changed. It's 23 and a half degrees. Now, when we're looking at the causes, we all understand about these longer summer days, warmer days, and the shorter and cooler winter days. It doesn't have to do with distance. Again, it has to do with that tilt. And that tilt is going to lead to, the tilt of the axis is going to lead to uh, the duration of sunlight and how much sunlight we get at different times of the year. So I got this from the readings here. You can see that during the winter, in this case January, we're, we're actually a little bit closer to the sun in terms of millions of kilometers uh, than we are in the summer. We're actually a little farther, right? But obviously summers are longer and warmer days, really because of that axis tilt. The other thing is, remember that Earth's orbit around the sun is not a circle. It's an ellipse with two foci, and so in this case, uh, there would be another foci or focus here, right? Uh, so we've talked about this already, Kepler's first law, right? And then obviously, when we start talking about the solstices, there's going to be the June solstice and winter solstice because even though it's June for us, and, it, and we like to call it the summer solstice, it's not summer in Australia. It's winter there, right? So the June solstice for the southern hemisphere means shorter days, colder days, right? So astronomers like to use the word June solstice and, and December solstice rather than in winter and summer. So again, that axis remains pointed toward the same direction in space throughout the year, right? Towards Polaris. And the orientation of this axis relative to the sun over the course of each orbit, obviously it's, it's tipped toward the sun in, in the northern hemisphere during the June solstice, and then it's tipped toward the sun in the southern hemisphere during the December solstice. It's really the beginning of summer in the southern hemisphere, so it's really opposite. Again, you know, summer solstice, winter solstice, the words we really want to start thinking about is June solstice and December solstice. During the June solstice, you can see that the sun rises farthest north in the northern hemisphere, so this is about a latitude around 40 degrees, which is somewhere in like in northern California. And you would see the sun reach really high in the sky when it crosses your, your local meridian there. And then also it'll set farthest in the north. And then that would be the, the June solstice. The December solstice for the northern hemisphere, you see that it's, it's going to rise farther south, not get very high in the sky, and then set farther south as well. And then the only time the sun rises directly east is on the equinoxes, right? Either the the September equinox or the March equinox. And there, you can see it rises and it goes to some intermediate level, uh, height there and then it sets directly west. So rising in the east and setting in the west. That's the only time we're seeing uh, the sun to rise directly uh, east. And so we also call that, we usually look, look for the two equinoxes for the same reason as calling the June solstice and December solstice, we like to call it the March equinox and the September equinox because again the equinoxes are based on whether you're transitioning from summer to winter or winter to summer right so uh, spring equinox fall equinox so it's, it's going to be different in in either hemisphere right so here they're showing the December solstice you can see there's more sunlight in the southern hemisphere and the, sh the days will be shorter in the northern hemisphere and again for the same reason we're following. So in this case, our, our December solstice would be this path down here in the Northern Hemisphere. So in terms of the solstices and equinoxes, the exact, the exact timing of these can vary uh, by a couple days on given dates. It really depends on the, the leap year cycle. The true orbital period around the sun is 365 and, day, and a quarter days, right? And that quarter days, we have to make up that every four years or so. So every four years, we have a leap year that's usually on. They, they make up a new date, which is February 29th, right? And then we actually did an exercise in class about with using the analemma, where you can figure out exactly at what latitude the sun will be directly overhead, right? So you can see it bouncing between 23 and a half degrees north and 20 half a degree, 20 half a degree, degrees south. So in other words, the sun is never directly overhead 
our latitude, which we're at around 36 degrees north. So we never see the sun directly 90 degrees above us. We always see it at an angle um, because the sun may be bouncing between the tropics. Maybe there's a tropic of Cancer up here, tropic of Capricorn down here. A picture of the sun taken about every 11 days or so from an area in Arizona. And you can see it traces out the analemma pattern. And so when the sun is highest in the sky here, that would be around the June solstice, June 21st. When it's lowest in the sky, that's the winter or the December solstice in the northern hemisphere. And so why why is the analemma asymmetrical? Why is this loop larger? So we saw earlier that in the winter, we're actually a little bit closer to the sun, which actually sp speeds the earth up a little bit faster around the sun. Uh, and then that gives us this kind of asymmetrical shape there, right? So it's really has to do with the, the distance in that case that gives us that analemma. And then the other part is, you know, we, we say the first day of summer is uh, the June solstice, first day of winter is the December solstice. But those days, like the, the December solstice is the shortest day of the year, the June solstice is the longest day. So why wouldn't it be the middle of that season? You know, longest day of the year should be warmest, but really it takes a little bit longer the earth to warm up, the oceans to warm up, and usually one to two months. So usually the warmest times of the year are like late July, August here in the Northern Hemisphere. So that would be our midsummer, right? And then we move our way to the equinox in the fall in September. And then uh, the other reason that we pick first day of summer and first day of winter is because it was easier for ancient peoples to identify those days and, and try to make a calendar. You know, there's some extreme conditions as you go farther north. Right, or south, you know, you get up to the Arctic Circle. So in this case, this is showing what the sun looks like at the June solstice. So you see at midnight, the sun is very close to the horizon, but not quite setting. And then you see it rise in its highest in the sky right around noon, and then it goes around and it'll set, or it doesn't really set, it stays in the horizon. So that means if you're anywhere north or at higher latitude of 66 and a half degrees, the sun never sets. Right? You get that perpetual, if you kind of go back to here, you can see that it's a perpetual sunlight, right? Uh, this would be the terminal. So the terminator line, you can see it, it's, it's going to sit at 66 and a half degrees. So as Earth spins, so everything north of 66 and a half degrees, north of that Arctic circle, will be in 24-hour sun. So that's why in this northern hemisphere, there's, you know, especially in the oceans up here, a lot of marine mammals, especially the gray whales migrate up there, humpback whales, because there's so much plankton blooming. I mean, there's sunlight 24 hours a day, and so the, the plankton bloom like crazy, and then there's lots of food up there for them. So again, that's a little bit about the Arctic Circle. And then the last section here is about precession. And remember, precession is this, this changing over time of the axis of rotation and where it's pointing, right? And it has a cycle about every 26,000 years. It, it does one, so any, any spinning object will kind of wobble. Like here's an example of a spinning top. The spinning top is spinning fast, but it's wobbling much slower, right? So in other words, the top spins rapidly about its axis, while its axis moves slowly, sweeping around a circle of precession. That would be our precession. Same thing with Earth. You know, we orbit, we spin in 24 hours pretty fast, but it takes 26,000 years for one precession cycle, right? So uh, that's kind of the idea there. And, and so currently our, our northern, um, our axis is pointing toward Polaris, but in about 15,000 years, it's going to be pointing towards Vega, right? So, um, so in other words, there's a little bit of a change there over time, which means that the shape of the constellations uh, that we see from Earth is going to be a little bit different, right? So precession does not change the amount of the axis tilt. It stays at the same, 23 and a half degrees. It does not affect the path. So we still see patterns of the season, right? Precession changes the points in the Earth's orbit at which the solstices and equinoxes occur, right? So that's where the constellations that we look at. This changes the constellations, right? So 2,000 years ago, the June solstice occurred when the sun appeared in the constellation Cancer. So the June solstice occurred when the sun was in the constellation Cancer. And I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, now it's in Gemini, right? But that's why the Tropic of Cancer is called the Tropic of Cancer, because it was named about 2,000 years ago. Uh, it was in Cancer, but now you can see it's changing over time. So this is played with the latitude at which the sun is directly overhead in June. It's called the Tropic of Cancer. Uh, telling us that it was named back when the sun appeared out um, on that you know, solstice. So if we think about um, 
So here is June, right? So so you can see that Cancer is here, right? So 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 in other words, this constellation was here and it's since moved to this position in two thousand years, basically. So now on the June, here's the Sun, June twenty first. The Sun is in the is in the constellation Gemini, right? Constellation Gemini. And just you know, I was thinking about these changing constellations. We always hear about this. The, the was it nineteen sixty nine musical Age of Aquarius hair. Remember that? Or I guess the musical was hair. This is one of the songs in the musical, the Broadway musical. And um, obviously, it's not an astronomy thing. It's a, more of an astrology thing. <laughs> so remember, astronomy is science and and observations and math and and, and calculations. Astrology is more you know supernatural and and um, and feelings attributed to to um, you know the patterns of stars and how it might affect uh, um, especially when you're born. That's why we have these these signs of the zodiac. If you're born Pisces or in, in Aries or whatever. In astrology, they they kind of take that precession right because it's changing right. And again, that cycle is twenty six thousand years. And we have 12 constellations. If you take 26,000 divided by 12, you get about 2160 something there. So, so roughly every you know, little over 2,000 years, uh, the sun changes. And, and where we're looking, we're looking at the vernal equinox, right? So when does the sun? So we go back here. So the vernal equinox, right? So that would be um, March, right? So March 21st, right? So the sun. So here we're March 21st, right here. Right, and so you can see the sun currently in, it is in Pisces, right? And then remember the constellations are, are rotating, are rotating, kind of count, counterclockwise here. In fact, uh, two thousand years ago, on March twenty first, when you looked at behind the sun, Aries was there, and Aries has since moved out of the way. So then the next one would be Aquarius. So over time, I think in another two thousand years or so, uh, we're going to see, or actually probably a little less than that. We'll see. But we'll see Aquarius, you know, with, on March 21st, Aquarius move there, and then that's where we talk about this age of Aquarius. And again, it's during this vernal equinox. So it'll move in front of a new zodiac uh, constellation. So, you know, in astrology, there's like a new age. And so uh, it's said to begin when the vernal equinox point moves from the point of the constellation Pisces to the point to in front of the constellation Aquarius. And um, so astronomically, and there was a astronomer in Belgium, I think, who figured this out, and he figured out that the last, the change from Aries to Pisces was 68 before Common Era, so about a little over 2,000 years ago. And so the question is, when will this age of Aquarius be? So here's another look. So in 2000, not very long ago, we see that the sun is in Pisces. So remember, these lines are the, like the maps for the constellations, right? And then these other little dots here, the kind of yellow lines connect the shapes of the fish, in this case, or Aquarius down over here. But anything that lay, lies within these borders is in the constellation of Aquarius, right? So there's uh, some debate between astrologers and astronomers, because astrologers just look, they want to make each constellation equal size, right? Each house the same, but obviously they're different sizes, right? And so uh, astronomers are going to have different dates for um, when this occurs. So in fact, you can see this is a one hour. So this is this is zero hour and the ecliptic. So where the ecliptic and the, the celestial sphere uh, or the celestial equator intersect, that's the vernal equinox, right? And so you can see that in 2500 common era, which is in about 500 years or so, uh, we're going to see the, the sun now and the vernal equinox where zero hours, there's one hour, zero hour, and the equinox intersect at that point we're going to enter Aquarius. So it's still not for a long time, although, you know, if you talk to astrologers, they say that we've, we've entered that, that age. So again, remember zero. So right now it's in Pisces, right? Over time, it should get over to uh, Aquarius, but not for another about 500 years or so. Anyways, I thought that was kind of interesting thinking about this age of Aquarius. All right, we'll stop here for now.